A very warm welcome and you are joining us at Talk24. Well, today's exclusive discussion is going to unfold certain answers with regards to a timely event that we all are curious about. Well, to discuss this, where is country's economy heading and what preventive actions that the country has taken to restore country's economic crisis and how to combat the challenges that is caused by the pandemic COVID-19. To discuss this and many more timely related financial economical issues, we have the best and the most suitable person joining on our show. Well, talk about this person actually is one of my favorites because he upholds a prestige and a precious portfolio in terms of country's political aspects. Not only that, being the governor for, being the central bank's governor for many years and also uh, the state minister of finance, capital markets and state enterprise reforms and who is also now the current 16th central bank governor of Sri Lanka. None other than Mr. Ajit Nawad Cabral. So, greetings for year 2022. Greetings to you too. Well, it's been quite the roller coaster ride for you. So, how are you holding up? Well, I must admit it has been a bit of a roller coaster ride. But I guess I'm used to it. I've been the governor, as you know, from 2006 to 2014. And that period too was quite a rough period where we had uh, so many events taking place in the world as well as in Sri Lanka. We were at war in, within the country. We had the oil crisis at that time, then the global uh, shock of the banks collapsing, economic crisis. With all that, we managed. So I guess uh, my life has been on the roller coaster. So once again, back on the roller coaster is not a new experience. So now that once again you are back on the roller coaster on your own will, or was it under some influence? Well, I had been very conscious that I don't want to do the job again right. when I finished in 2015 January. And I had made up my mind that I won't want to be the governor again because I know what a rough roller coaster ride it is. But however, in September, the president made me a, made me a uh, request, a very earnest request that I couldn't refuse. And I had to accept that. And I was, uh, now that I'm back again, I have no regrets. I know it's a challenging time. I went into it with my eyes and ears open. So I will not have regrets either. So let's see how it goes. Indeed it is. Actually, uh, he is contributing, uh, he is sharing his expertise, knowledge and skills because he has a profound uh, educational background. Also, I must say, he is quite the talk of the universities as well, I must say, since I'm a part of the Columbia University. So uh, to begin with, actually, now that uh, there's a foreign death commitment in Sri Lanka, which is happening, and if I'm not mistaken, by the 18th of January, we'll have to settle the first installment. So how, what is the plan? Yes, we have already allocated the funds that are needed to settle that $500 million. Many people have been uh, expressing concern that we won't be able to make that payment. Uh, sometimes our own uh, people here, particularly the opposition politicians, have been uh, trying their best to bring some destability by saying we won't be able to settle the loan. But we have already allocated the money and we may be one of the few countries that have a rating which is in the CC category but having the bonds which are trading at par. So it's a, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a paradox, as it were. But uh, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that we settle our loans, that we give the impression as well as the uh, idea to the world that we have the wherewithal to settle it. And we will do that. And there is no question about it. And by doing so, uh, we will be gradually able to build confidence within our economy and I think uh, that's being now recognized by the world and the fact that our bonds are trading at the par level is a good sign and we will continue with that uh, journey that we have started. Now having said that, uh, does the government has any plan on uh, you know, seeking assistance, financial assistance from IMF? If so, what could be the possible repercussions that uh, would reflect on the country's economy and the government uh, mechanisms? That's a very good question. I know some several people have um, raised this matter at various times, but I must say very clearly that as far as Sri Lanka is concerned right now, 
we are on track to make payment for all the creditors that have lent money to us. At the same time, uh, although we did have some rough times, particularly because of the tourism uh, being uh, disturbed or distracted with the, with the pandemic, we are now gradually getting back into shape. So we would be able to commit to ours, um, make sure that all our commitments are met. And we would also ensure that Sri Lanka is able to uh, have necessary resources for all its activities. So therefore, we don't see a reason as to why we should bring in a sense of uncertainty into the minds of our creditors and also put them in some kind of uh, uncomfortable situation. So we are settling the loans. We are settling our creditors. So then there is no issue at all. So that's what we are saying clearly that we can manage this uh, situation without having recourse to a third party. And if, if we can do that, why should we go and uh, uh, get uh, another party to come into this equation? If you can build your house with your own resources, uh, you don't need to go and uh, get somebody else's assistance. So that's the kind of um, analogy that you can draw. And we would uh, be uh, going on that according to that plan. It's not that we have anything against the IMF. In fact, the biggest standby facility that Sri Lanka received was under my tenure as the previous governor. And we were quite happy to have it at that time because that was a suitable thing to do. And that time, although it was suitable, it doesn't mean that this time is suitable. However, um, is there um, a government policy that is in place to manage these foreign currency reserves? Yes. We have uh, articulated that on many occasions. In fact, the six-month uh, roadmap that we unfolded on the 1st of October, which we are following now, clearly lays down the guidelines as to what we are hoping to do and what we are doing. And what we are doing is very clear. We have at various times uh, given uh, certain, uh, 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 certain uh, reports as to what our outputs have been and what the outcomes are. And we are sticking to that and moving forward. So I'm, I'm sure that by the end of the March, uh, most of these uh, tensions that we had would be uh, behind us and we would be able to have a much clearer uh, journey with greater certainty. And that's what we are gently steering the economy towards. Now, there is a rumor, I don't know to which extent now this is true or not, about the depreciating rupee. So what is your take on that? Actually, since April 2021, mm -hmm. we have been by and large able to maintain the rupee at a very steady rate. Of course, there are some instances where because of black market uh, activities that we, we, we do see some people raising about a rate, mm -hmm. which is different. Mm -hmm. If you take the numbers itself, about $60 billion of worth of transactions take place in a year. In fact, at the current rate of exchange at two, around 200 rupees. Another 2 billion may be taking place at a rate of about 230 or 240 in the black market. So what some people talk about as a black market is this $2 billion window where the black market operations are taking place, uh, maybe more, maybe less, slightly. But they are trying to suggest that this rate of 230 or 40, which is being used by the black market for transactions which total around 2 billion, must be brought to this other transactions which are about 60 billion. So that's completely a wrongful uh, uh, interpretation of the situation. And what we are saying is, if at all someone needs to move, it is the black market that should move towards the uh, regular rate. And we are moving towards that uh, position. And I believe over a period of time, when stability has been assured, even the black market rates will drop con considerably, which will make it sure, will, will make it that the rates that are prevailing in the black market will no longer be uh, termed as people wanting to have as the normal rate. In fact, I saw one of the ministers also saying that, and I was uh, quite surprised that uh, those people are also articulating this, because it shows that they have no depth on the subject, which is unfortunate. I hope that they would also learn that. So now that question leads to my next question, actually. That's about this shadow economic crisis. I really don't like to use the term black market. But then again, uh, in places like York Street and Vallavatta, as you know, so this um, dollar uh, rate 
it's like 260 rupees you can get it from there but when it comes to government you give it uh, on the rate of uh, 210 so don't you think that people would anyways resort to the lesser price the higher price and then they will get better gains out of it there are some elements who will go to that mm -hmm. and i think there are various uh, background activities also that support that mm -hmm. in fact the entirety of the drug trade is based on this uh, type of fundial transactions. That is why those who are indulging in those transactions are actually indirectly supporting the funding of the drug trade, which is very unfortunate. Sometimes they may not know, but we have had a campaign which has been launched by the central bank where we have uh, educated the people exactly what the repercussions of uh, doing these transactions are. So I think that's something that people should now begin to realize and not uh, support these transactions. But as I mentioned to you, all those transactions in total will probably be around 2 to $3 billion. But the transactions that take place, imports, exports, remittances, government transactions, invisible imports and exports, all that comes to around $60 billion. So $60 billion of transactions are done at 200 rupees per dollar, around that. So, 2 to 3 billion dollars of transactions, which are actually supporting the underground and the illegal activities, are taking place at the 250 mark or 240 mark that you mentioned. So, uh, th that is not, not a justification at all for the regular market to move to the shadow market that you are talking about. Whereas, if at all, what we should do is to attempt to stop the shadow market from op operating or reduce the activities of that because they are actually supporting the illegal and unlawful activities and bring it in line with the normal exchange rate that is prevailing in the country. So, uh, that is unfortunate that people have this impression. I am so glad that you asked that question because that is very helpful to explain this situation to the rest of the country and I hope that your uh, viewers will take note of that. Well, uh, that was quite a take on that actually. Uh, coming back to my next question, uh, now there is this moratorium facility. So, is it in effect and have you extended the period? Yes, this moratorium has been in effect since about 1st April 2020. And we have officially informed the markets that it would be lifted by the 31st of March 2022. So, that will be about two years. What it means is, uh, Monisha, that this uh, period has been given as a kind of an interval mm -hmm. to borrowers not to pay their loans because of the COVID mm -hmm. pandemic and the repercussions as of that followed, but to ensure that they are able to uh, do their, continue with their business uninterrupted. But at some stage or the other, it has to be lifted. But I have this question now, the payments, the dreaded payments, won't that uh, impact the country's economy? Because the moratorium facility will f anyways definitely have an impact on the dreaded payments, uh, the defer deferred payments, right? Yeah. yeah, they will have to make that payment too, because yeah. this is a liability that they have incurred, they have taken on the liability, mm -hmm. so they have to repay that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the banks and the finance companies will be in trouble. Yeah. So, this has been a kind of an interval mm -hmm. that has been provided so that they will get the space to not pay the loans for the period of time, but sooner or later, actually from 1st April, they will have to make that payment. But we are trying to see how best we can soften that also, because we know some businesses may not have recovered sufficiently, and in which case we have to hold their hand for a few more months mm -hmm. and maybe give them some support. Mm -hmm. So, the central bank also has allocated a sum of about 15 billion rupees to support the interest payments on those periods. But at the same time, uh, we also want to make that landing as soft as possible. So, we'll be, we are working out various ways in which that can be done. And in fact, in our roadmap, we announced that as well. But we would be definitely having to make that move because without that, the country cannot get back to normal. Now, the pandemic will be over soon, hopefully. And with that, the normalcy must return. And when normalcy returns, we have to make sure that uh, people are not overly burdened. But at the same time, we have to make sure that they do pay their debts as well. So that's a balance that we have to strike. Yes, that's yeah. very important that we have the balance. Uh, it's something that has to be done carefully. And we are on the job now to make sure that that happens. 
Now, uh, there is a dearth of the foreign remittances and also uh, the income that used to pump from the tourism industry has also come down. So, what is your take on this and uh, do you think that the situation might change in the near future? Tourism has already started to uh, show signs of uh, getting back to earlier levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe we won't get back to early levels in 2022, but perhaps by 2023 we can get back to that level, which will be very important because tourism provides us about four and a half billion dollars worth of uh, inflows into the country, and that's important for us to uh, have. And at the same time, remittances also had dropped because the number of people who could go abroad had reduced due, due to the yeah. pandemic and also due to the, these um, other Hawala activities, there were people who were beginning to make use of their remittances uh, in the underground basis without doing it in the official manner. That has also hurt us to some extent. But we are taking action there also. As you know, we recently gave 10 rupees more for dollars that come in and are being converted. So that's an additional incentive. And we are also taking steps to deal with those who are uh, resorting to uh, uh, underground practices in uh, remitting as well. So that, we believe, would uh, help to get remittances back to the normal levels. And with the tourism re getting back to normal, I think we will be on the right track to ensure that additional revenues in foreign exchange comes back into the country. Now, uh, earlier there were restrictions on importing the production inputs. So uh, now that the uh, dollar reserves have come up to 3.1 billion, is there going to be change in this? Yes, we have allowed those who are exporting to have uh, their imports also paid for with the export earnings. And that is part of the rule that we have uh, provided. That's, that rule is similar to what India follows, Bangladesh, Thailand, uh, several other countries as well. So that is uh, providing the space for those who are exporting to have the necessary uh, dollars to make their imports as well. And in addition to that, we have, we have ensured that the key imports that are necessary for the country, for example, fuel, uh, then um, coal, then um, medicine, as well as uh, gas, that those are provided for uh, with the steps that we have taken from the uh, central bank to have uh, mandatory conversions mm -hmm. for uh, out of the remittances as well as the proceeds that banks have so that we will make sure that those are supported. Mm -hmm. And in addition, banks will have 75% yeah. of the total monies that they receive. So that would mean that they have the ability to uh, fund other imports mm -hmm. and that is happening. In fact, uh, last month in J December, we had one of the highest import values that was recorded. So obviously, people are bringing goods uh, f to the country, even with uh, the sometimes people saying that there are restrictions. So obviously, it is happening even without the vehicles. So that's a good sign. And also at the same time, it is putting additional pressure to maintain the equilibrium, which is tough for us, for us but we will be managing that. So basically, we are actually surviving the game at the moment. Yes, we are, it's always a balance in economics, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the economic management. There is no exact uh, science or no exact amount that we can be talking about. There are always changes that occur. So it's a dynamic process which we are managing. And in ma managing a dynamic process, we have to take decisions as we go along. And that's why um, sometimes it is a little stressful, but uh, we, are, we are managing. So now you said uh, the situation is sort of an equi equilibrium. So, but then again, now this printing money, so putting money into the system, so it's like higher the supply, higher the price, according to the economy norms. So don't you feel that it might impact or it might uh, open doors for an inflation? Yes, or is it already a there? Theory. Yes, or that's a normal there. theory, which is also true. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at the time of the pandemic, we did realize that the normal demand was reduced considerably. Okay. So having additional monies pumped in, and in the US as well as in every country, we had uh, this money printing, which is actually the treasury bill holdings of mm -hmm. the central bank mm -hmm. rising. Mm -hmm. And that was being resorted to by many countries in order to provide the space as well as the support to economies to progress. Mm -hmm. And that was happening. It happened in Sri Lanka as well. 
But when demand becomes normal, and we are getting back to normalcy in the next few months, we have to also pull that back. You would have seen that happening in the Treasury bill auctions. We have been uh, gently reducing the money printed uh, in circulation and the Treasury bill holdings of the central bank have been gently reduced. So we are on the right track there as well. It's not that we don't recognize that there is some risk, but at the same time, we have to weigh which risk is the high risk. So it's very easy for someone uh, who has gone through Google and asked about money printing to make a comment. But when you are dealing with it, you're dealing with the real life. You're dealing with real conditions. And then sometimes you have to deal with it in that manner so that you make sure that the balance is struck. It's not that we don't know if people who Google know that there is a risk. I think all the top people at the central bank know that there is a risk. But sometimes you've got to take a risk. It's like sometimes you have to have an operation for some uh, ailment that you're having. Of course, that's a risk. But you take that risk because, you know, if you don't do the operation, you can be at a worse risk. So in the same way, when you have uh, money printed, uh, it has some risk. But we, we also know that it has to be pulled back, which is a calculated risk. Which is a calculated risk. So we are pulling that back. Mm -hmm. And when pulling back, uh, uh, it would be back to normal in, in a certain period of time. And that during that period, we got to uh, steer it, navigate through those waters very carefully. Yeah. So now, since we discuss about these import and export markets, uh, now we are losing the ground to the countries in terms of tea and garment manufacturing. So what is your take on that? Actually, in the case of exports, uh, we have managed to increase our exports to the highest value that Sri Lanka ever had last year, which is good. So notwithstanding all what people said, uh, that we will have a reduction in our uh, exports. We have been able to uh, make that not an accurate statement and the exports have actually increased, so which is a good sign. But that doesn't mean that, that we are working to our potential. There may be still more that we can do and we must strive for that. There are still new markets that we can access. There are still new uh, types of uh, goods that we can um, export. There are new services that we can export, particularly the IT, IT services, the BPO services, the outsourcing services, then uh, other services like insurance, consultancies, architecture, accountancy. All those are also new possibilities that we should be able to uh, en uh, enhance. So we got to take action to ensure that all those areas will be also rising. And if we do that well, and then we are also able to send uh, better qualified, better equipped people outside to start working, rather than just sending unskilled workers uh, without sending housemaids, if we can send caregivers, uh, it makes a big difference. So that's what we are hoping to do. And if those practices uh, gain traction, I think Sri Lanka will have a much better balance of payments. So, um, now that we discuss about this, uh, there was an allowance that uh, we have declared, the government has declared of Rs. 5,000 5, to the government employees. So, again now coming back to the inflation thing, so that also has a direct impact with the inflation and it's only, th this relief is only given to the government employees and does that make a significant difference by giving 5,000 rupees? I do agree that uh, when you give uh, concessions, it must be broad based. And sometimes people may criticize a decision where only a certain segment <coughs> of the population, particularly those who have been fairly well protected, are being provided with a additional support. So I think we need to broad base that. We need to ensure that we reduce the cost of living to a great extent rather than only uh, focus on a particular segment. Yes, so in the reliefs also, the government is, um, I think, um, will have to look at certain other types of reliefs. I know the president has been very keen that we reduce the prices of certain commodities which people use regularly. So if that is the case, um, I hope that the government will take the necessary steps to uh, deal with the prices of certain foodstuffs. Uh, and that would be even more effective than uh, giving a salary increase or allowances because that would mean that uh, the president's vision 
of uh, giving a greater number of people the support as well as the ability to uh, bounce back after the pandemic is provided. So I would like to see additional attention being given to that side as well. Okay. So now this question has been, uh, you know, juggling in my mind. I was thinking that whether should I put it out or not. So it's basically about the SMEs, small, medium enter entrepreneurs. So now basically they actually were holding the country's economy to an extent. But do we really support them? Do the government, I mean, does the government really support them? And what sort of plans do you have? Yeah, actually the SME sector is a very important sector, the small and medium me enterprises. They provide, I think, the GDP contribution of around 55% of um, this country's entire value. Uh, but if you look at it, you'd find that this government gave tax reliefs, sometimes to the extent of being criticized for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then reduce the interest rates. The interest rates were reduced for a considerable period of time. Now, although it has inched up a little bit, but it's still much lower than what it was in 2019. The, the tax relief was known as there was a uh, particular name to it, right? The taxes were, uh, there were certain cuts okay. in taxes that helped them to uh, uh, conserve money in their hands yeah. rather than pay to the government, government. So, which, is, which is a good thing. Yeah. Then, if you take the pandemic itself, there were many of them were affected by, as a result of the pandemic. But during that period, they were enjoying a moratorium, yeah. which the government also uh, steered to provide. Now, that moratorium alone uh, has been around 4,100 billion rupees out of the total sum of uh, loans, which is about uh, 10 to 11 billion, uh, 11, I'm sorry, uh, 11,000 billion, that is 10 to 11,000 billion, that is 10 to 11 trillion, trillion. rupees. <coughs> about 4.1 trillion or 4,100 billion was the value of the moratorium, which was provided to them. If not, they would have been struggling. <coughs> Sorry. Which shows that the government has been sensitive to that. Government has made sure that they are able to uh, traverse through this difficult period with some support. So I, I think the uh, SME sector has enjoyed those benefits to a great extent. Maybe the, more needs to be done. More attention must be paid to their uh, skills sets so that they will be able to do it better for them to be able to rely on IT more uh, and then to access markets. So all these will be the new issues that will have to be uh, coped with. But I think um, the government has supported them also to a great extent. Now that uh, you have been um, in this political arena for quite some time and also you have uh, you know, um, a proper and a profound education background, I've done my research. So my question to you is that um, still we don't see a long-term and a progressive uh, policy in terms of economy in this country. I must say this country has done reasonably well mm -hmm. in the 73 years of its independence. Okay. When Sri Lanka got independence, we had only one university. Today we have 17 state universities and 46 private universities in this period of time. We had only half a percent of the people having electricity. Today we have one, nearly 100 percent of the people having electricity. We had only half a percent of the people having water on tap. Today we have 43 percent of the people having water on tap. The roads that we had were all tarred roads, uh, very few of them, but most of the roads were not even tarred. Today we have about 60,000 kilometers of concreted as well as tarred roads. We have about nearly 250 kilometers of highways. We have A-grade roads which are about 17,000 kilometers. So all that has occurred since independence. We have about 10,000 schools which are providing secondary and ter tertiary education. These have all happened, these have all happened, health services, improvements. Although we criticize the period since independence, I don't think it's very fair because after Sri Lanka got independence, a huge change has occurred. People, if you take back and look at the pictures of our ports, look at it in 1948, what it was like. Look at our roads, look at the types of vehicles that were on the roads, look at the number of people who owned houses or owned uh, assets. There has been a vast change. I'm not saying we have 
kept pace with Singapore or some countries like that. But we have done reasonably well. And the education that our people have is one of the highest levels in the world. Our, our, uh, even our uh, health services are reasonably good and we have been able to see that the backlog is not as much. I am the first to admit there is a lot more to be done. But I don't think we should despair that we haven't done anything. So uh, with all the difficulties that we have had to undergo, uh, with uh, several uh, insurrections, with uh, certain difficulties that we have faced in bringing uh, harmony within the communities, we have still been able to do reasonably well. So let us not despair that we have been not doing well. We will have more to do. We have to get our act together economically. Our per capita income, which was only $57 in 1948, is today nearly $3,800, which is reasonably good. It's not $60,000. Maybe we should aspire for that over a period of time. But we need to work on that with the rest of our parameters also kept in shape. So uh, let's work on that. Let, we have to work together to ensure that these are, uh, these are uh, harnessed carefully. And uh, I am confident that Sri Lanka will have a good journey if we can bring stability to make sure that people are happy and then we can perhaps uh, be a lot more contented than we are today. Okay, so that was my last question to you and uh, we know that uh, how busy uh, he is actually because uh, whoever is uh, who is an outsider, they don't see the weight that you have to carry on your shoulder because it's really not an easy piece of cake. So at the same time, uh, congratulations on the way that you have been listed as the fifth Sri Lankan citizen on the table of uh, presidents as well. So uh, with that, uh, we thank you and it was a privilege. It was quite educational and qualitative at the moment. So thanking for you. And at the same time, uh, it's a wrap and we promise you to come back with another exclusive and a timely discussion topics like this in our next segment. Thank you.